kind of nerve uh, <laughs> testing. So, um, just very briefly, we're not going to do very hard thinking about this uh, here, but there are a few assumptions that we will uh, work under with these regression models. So you have this linear model like this, and there are a few assumptions that we need to, to take care of. Um, first of all, the error terms here should be independent of each other. So it means if you sort of look at your data downwards, the error terms should be equally likely to go up and down regardless of what the previous error term, for instance, did. So these can be a little bit tricky to understand, but uh, let's just list them up like this. Um, this one is easier to understand, and it's a limitation of regression analysis, actually. But it says that this we are modeling the error term as a random variable. And we are actually going to have to assume that it's normal. And moreover, we are assuming that the expected value is 0. And finally, that the standard deviation is some number that is the same for all uh, pairs of observations in the data set. So this has, for instance, the, the, the particular implication that we should be a little bit careful if our data set looks like which something like this, which happens sometimes. So what does this mean? You have x here, and you have y here. And you can easily estimate some kind of line here. But what you see is that the, the error term tends to be much larger out here than down here. So here you have tiny deviations. You can do very precise forecasting down here, while up here you have to live with fairly substantial deviations. So this kind of picture is not really appropriate in this, at least for the, the basic regression. There are ways to deal with it, but in the sort of basic estimation, we will like to see a picture where the variability is more homogeneous along the, the x variable. So this has a very horrible name, this condition here, that this is constant. It's called um, homoskedasticity. This is the assumption of homoskedasticity. And the opposite is heteroskedasticity. Sounds like some awful disease. But it's the problem of different size of deviations along the x-axis. Anyway, so just to refer back to those later, these assumptions. And let's focus on the more technical part, which is the parameter estimation. And this is something that you might have seen. It's called the least square method, LSM. And Yeah, it's fairly easy. I can just draw a picture to you. X and Y. And what we want to do is to just take some given line here. Say Y equal to A0 plus A1X. And then I want to measure how 
well. Does it fit to data? And if I can measure with some number how well this line fits, then I can later on just choose the one that fits best. So if I can do this measurement, I'm sort of ready to do my estimation. And it's very easy, actually. Um, I just draw this line. This is just an arbitrary line. Uh, and I'm going to make one that fits not too well. So that one you see with your own eyes that is not going to be the best fitting line to this data set. Maybe more something like this would be better off. But let's just, this is just for measurement, so let's see. I'm going to just prolong this a little bit. So what are we doing here? I look at all my XI data points. And I get corresponding uh, yi hat, which is the value that this particular line gets for me if I insert my xi into the equation. So this line would forecast that y value. And how good is it? I measure by seeing looking at this thing, which I call EI. And this value here is, of course, YI. This is the actual observation that belongs to this XI. So this is YI hat minus YI. And obviously, uh, you want a line that makes most of these differences as small as possible, right? So, and how can we measure on the whole data set the sort of total size of these things? Well, we have this typical statistical way of doing it. We take the square of all of them and sum it over the whole data set. So I just take the square of that, and then there's another one close to here, this one, and there's that one, this one, that one, this one, and this one. And I sum them, and then I say, that's the measure of fit, and I want it to be as small as possible. So probably for this particular line here, it's not going to be optimal. But if I adjust my line a little bit more like this, I would get something that was a little bit better. So we're going to call SSE. It's the square sum of errors. It's the minimal value that we can obtain in this way. And the corresponding line that minimizes will be what we call the regression line. So this is a picture from the compendium, but you see it's very extreme. The red line is, of course, a horrible uh, suggestion for a line for this data set. It does not even fit anything <laughs> at all, I would say. So most of the deviations here are enormous. Um, the blue line is what I would call a fairly good fit. This is just sort of drawn by inspection, just guessing. And the black line is actually the line coming from SPSS, which is optimal. And this is, yeah, I don't have the equation for that. It doesn't really, it's probably, uh, it's the line. This is probably the duration and distance data. So it's the same line as before. So this is the least squares method, and it's called least squares because you minimize a sum of squares, right? So you take the least sum of squares. And of course, with a data set of this magnitude, it's completely impossible to do this 
in any other way than to insert it into something like Excel or SPSS or something and to do these computations. So it's not something for hand calculations, but something you get out of SPSS. It, it, it's possible to make kind of a formula that involves correlation coefficients and standard deviations of the variables, but we will exclusively use SPSS to compute these kind of estimates. But it's nice to know a little bit about how they come about. Okay, so we are not, yeah. How do you do this in SPSS? It's very simple and very obvious. There's a menu called analyzed, there's a submenu called regression, and there's a submenu called linear. So that's certainly where we're going to go. And you can specify the dependent variable here, and that would be the duration, if you look at this data. And then you have independent, so there can be several of them, but we are, for the time being, looking at only single x variables. Right. So you specify distance here, you keep the method to something called enter, and then we just click OK. And then we get some output, which part of it is shown here. And this is the key output, you might say. So it's fairly well explained here. You see this column B, it holds the coefficient estimates. So B0 is the constant, it's 1.16. and the B1, that's the one that rules for x, which is the distance variable, is about 2.23. So this was the equation that we had earlier on. It was 1.16 plus this. So you just read this equation out of this table. And Basically, we can, yeah, the uncertainty in a way, the, the uncertainty of these estimates are expressed by the standard deviation that you find in these columns. So we'll be more specific about that later. But the confidence intervals will depend on this and this in the end. And we'll explain this output here later on. It's, of course, cigarettes related to some tests, p-value. And there's a t here, which is a t statistic. We're going to have to come back to that slightly later. So the final, maybe, yeah, final topic is also the maybe challenging one. It's about inference in regression. So what does inference mean? It means. Uh, what we have been doing a little bit in chapter three, making statements about unknown model parameters based on known estimates. So we talked about uh, mu and stuff, and proportions by doing tests and confidence intervals, and that is actually inference. But now we're going to do that on regression parameters. Um, So I'm going to be pretty quick with the background here, but um, what, 
what we do is actually to okay we have this model and then we take a sample of data and this is a random sample and we just compute the let's see we compute the least square estimates b0 and b1 so yeah, i call for technical assistance on that guy but we just have to wait for that to happen magically about it I think just to check that if it's coming it seems to come like very slowly so what we do is to think in the same way as before these estimates here they are trying to estimate beta 0 and beta 1 and we think of them as random variables because they are based on a random sample so for instance beta 1 it has a standard deviation which is very much related to the uncertainty of that estimate and we call that SB1 <laughs> no. So we have a very important result, it's a very theoretical result, but still important, which says that if I look at B1 minus beta 1 divided by S B1. And you call this T. It's going to have a known distribution. So this is the kind of so sort of magical result in statistics. It's exactly the same as when we said x bar minus mu over s over the square root of n as okay we said sometimes a standard normal distribution or we said a t distribution this is exactly the result that made possible confidence intervals and testing So if I have a H0 hypothesis saying mu is equal to 10, then I can operate as if this is true. So I can put x bar minus 10 or s of the square root of n. Standard normal if this is true. So I know the distribution if uh, H0 is true. And then I can just observe the value of this. And if I see 5.3, I know it's no way that this is going to be true. Because 5.3 is a horribly unlikely value for anything that's standard normal. So this kind of magical result leads to these things. And this result is exactly the same kind of result. It's an estimate, b1, like x bar. It's a parameter, like mu. And it's some estimated standard deviation down here, like this one. The formulas are a little bit different for this one. And we're not even going to bother with it. We're going to take this number just from SPSS. But we have this result. And I haven't written the result yet, but it says, uh, it says here, 
this guy has a T distribution with n minus 2 degrees of freedom. Okay. So if we do the calculations just like we did before with this, we immediately get a formula for the confidence intervals for, uh, for beta 0 and beta 1. And here I put beta 1, I could just put beta i here, or, yeah. So it's valid for e i equal to 0 or 1. So the same goes for both parameters. And then you just get the confidence interval. It's the estimate plus minus the standard deviation times this kind of t alpha half thing from the t distribution with n minus 2 degrees of freedom. So this is the theoretical formula. Um, We can actually talk SPSS into providing such intervals for us if we like also. But I think it's OK that we have some feeling where they come from. So this is confidence interval for the parameters. And then there's testing. Um, testing of some hypothesis. So today I will only do this, which we call the standard test. The standard test for the regression coefficients. And let's look at beta 1. The standard test, the H0 says beta 1 is 0. And the alternative is just the two-sided. Right. So this is a test. Then we're going to use something. Um, we have to have a test statistic. Which is something which has a known distribution. If H0 is true and something that is computable from sample. So it's those two characteristics that makes testing possible in a way. OK, so if beta 1 is 0, I can insert beta 1 0 into this expression, which then takes the form b1 minus 0 divided by s b1. And if h0 is true, then this should also be t distributed in the same way. And of course, this reads just b1 over s b1. So you just look at this value here, and if it's too far from 0, like outside plus minus 2 or something, you realize that it's in conflict with the null hypothesis. So this sig that is in the SPSS output is actually the p-value for this test here. So you look back at this uh, output here. You see, you can forget about this beta here, at least for the rest of this semester. But you should note this t column here. It is the t statistic for this standard test. And the column sig here is the corresponding p value. So especially for beta 1, which is relating to this line of output, the t statistics I is about 41, which is completely horrible, far away from zero. So the p value 
is zero for all practical proofs. Regarding the constant, it's not that clear. You have a t that is very close to 2 here, it's 1.98, and the p value is just below 0 0.05, so it's more uncertain there. That means the rejection of the null hypothesis is more uncertain regarding the constant in, in, in this particular case. Now, why do we do this standard test, especially for beta 1? Consider what does it mean that beta 1 equals 0. Remember the model is like this. Uh, it says that um, x affects y with a linear function and the slope is beta 1. But what happens if we cannot reject this hypothesis? Well, then we have no statistical evidence that beta 1 is really different from 0. And if beta 1 is 0, what does the model say? It says this. So beta 1 equal to 0 means really no linear dependency. So this is the first <coughs> or the third number that we should look at probably is this p-value here. First you look at beta 0, beta 1, and then this p-value for testing beta 1 equal to 0. And if you cannot reject H0, your model is dead in a way. I mean, you have sort of no evidence that X affects Y in, in, in any way. So if you want to go further and do something with this model, you should be able to reject this one in favor of that one. And in this case, with the duration data here, it is very clear, and we knew that, of course, by just looking at the data, that there has to be a, a linear effect. So this confirms. Uh, yeah. OK. So we're going to do mostly do this with the SPSS. Um, you just go into the general regression dialog, choose confidence intervals, and ask to get 95%, and you get this thing here. No, I just wiped out the formula, but who cares? Um, So you can see here 95% confidence interval for B is from 212 uh, to 233. While the point estimate for beta 1 was about 2.23. So this expresses the uncertainty in that estimate, right? And normally we're used to thinking about confidence intervals like this. So here is my estimate, and then there's an upper and a lower limit, 2.12, 2.23. On the beta, beta 1 scale, you might say. So we are pretty confident that the true slope is somewhere in this interval. OK, since this is a regression parameter, it's the slope of a line. It has a particular meaning. So what it means actually is this, something like this. We estimated this line with a slope 2.23. But the uncertainty in that slope estimate uh, needs us to 
consider as high as this and as low as this. So we could draw the higher estimate line is something like this, and the lower will be something like this. So even though we get a model line estimated here, we should have in mind that the true line might be sloping this way or that way a little bit. And clearly, the size of this interval determines how much this wiggles up and down. Yeah. So here is confidence intervals. The confidence interval for the constant is almost from 0 to 2.3. So, yeah, it means in a way, I mean, it means that the, the line should cut this axis somewhere here from 0 0.10 up to 2.3 something. Yeah. And the estimate is, it should actually be the cut point here if I draw it. Yeah. Let's do this. It's going to be a little bit hard, but it's soon going to be over. Uh, we're going to have just a few things more to address. Okay. There's something called the splitting, the variation. And okay, let's draw just a simple set of data like here. You might have a regression line, something like this. And when you look at the Y data, there's somewhere oh. somewhere there's an average Y value, right? So for these trips of uh, this transport company, there's something like an average duration. And you observe that y values, they deviate, or they vary, of course, from the mean. And what we like to do in regression is to s try to um, blame this variation on two sources now, actually. So y is varying. And there are two causes. It's the dependency on x. So this is related to the fact that x goes from some low, some short trips, to some long trips. And this causes y to vary. And then additionally, there's another source of variation, which is randomness. And it so happens that we can measure the contribution of each of these sources, right? So we have seen one of the sources already. It's what we call SSE. This was the sum of the residuals squared. And oh, this thing doesn't like my lectures, right? So this is measures randomness. And this measures um, x dependency. So one defines the total total variation.
the Y data. It's defined by something called SST, and it's simply the sum of these two guys. SSR plus SSE. And so we want to measure, in a way, the qu we want to quantify how much of this variation in, in Y data can we attribute to the X dependency. This really means how much variation in Y is caused by x. Yeah. See if it can hang on for a few more slides. So basically, the more variation we can say is caused by x, the, the stronger this dependency is. And we want some measures on that in this regression setting. So we split like this, and then the central measure here is what we call the R square. You will see a lot of this number during regression analysis. It's just the ratio of X dependency variation to total uh, variation for the Y variable. So it's going to be somewhere between 0 and 1. And if it's close to 1, it means most of the variation in the variable y is related to x dependency. Okay. Yeah. So it's often called the uh, x. explanatory power of the model. It means how much of the variation in one variable can we explain with our x variable. And typically, we want as much as, as possible. OK, so. Related to also the splitting of variation, let's look a little bit at this guy. We saw it before. It's exactly what we minimize when we do this uh, least squares thing. So we take our data points and we try to find a line that minimizes all such errors. And it's the sum of all of this squared. So it seems natural that the, the standard deviation estimate, which we call, okay, this parameter was the standard deviation of the error term. So it's natural that the estimate for this one is related to these guys here. And it actually happens very nicely through this sum here. So the estimate is just as simple as that. So I don't have to write it here, actually. It's just the square root of this sum divided by n minus 2. And n is the sample size. Yep. Yep. So let's um, just keep in mind, this is the estimate. Let me find some more. So the uh, important
importance of this thing is actually that we um, we have our estimated model and you take one x variable here you forecast uh, y but we realize the y value is not actually going to be exactly this one it's going to have some deviation away from it and how large is this going to be well we said that the deviation could be something like this it's a random variable but this is normal it has expectation zero and it has a standard deviation that was sigma e so roughly speaking with 95 percent probability y should be between um, if we say y pred for this predicted value then it should be between y pred plus minus 2 sigma e for a normal distribution plus minus 2 standard deviation is very close to 95 percent now we cannot find this value exactly but we can estimate it so we get y prediction plus minus 2 times the estimate. And there we have what we call a margin of error for the estimate. So if your sample is not too small, which means typically more than 30 in statistics, we can measure the forecast accuracy quite well in this way. Of course, the two there is just because we have 95% and it's possible to say 99%, you get some other factor before here, but it's always going to be related to the SE like this. Okay, so we'll just finish off here. Um, so relating to the splitting of variation, here is a little bit more of the SPSS output. Um, I have some slides with an overview of this if it's getting too much for you, but the key numbers here, this is obviously the R square. Um, and this is the SE estimate. So it says here, for some reason, it says standard error of the estimate. I don't know why that name is used, but it's this number here, it's about 2.22. And um, here it says sum of squares in this ANOVA table. ANOVA means analysis of variance. So we split the var variance. And you get square sums. And here it says residual. That's the SSE, which is something like 974. And the SSR is this here. It's in the line regression. It's about 8,000. So there's a lot more in the SSR than it was in the SSE. And the total is just about uh, 9.3 something. So this number here, this R square at about 0 0.90, is just this square sum divided by the total square sum, right? As in this formula. So it's 0 0.90. Meaning, in a way, that we say 90% of let's see if I have it. yeah, we we will we'll do it like this. So you have the R square here, 0 0.895. That's about 0 0.90. So we say 90% of duration. variability is caused by distance variation. So as researchers, we would say the obvious thing, but this shows us that distance is a very heavy factor in determining the duration, right? 
And in other research situations, it wouldn't have been that obvious what would be the major causes and so on. But in this, it's very transparent. So. And then we have another 10%, which we say is not explained by this model. So what we could do is either to say that this is just some randomness that is too complicated to handle, or we could say, I want to try additionally some other variables. But then we have to wait a few weeks to get to multiple regression. OK. So just summarizing this trip duration example at high speed, we find this highly significant dependency, of course. The p-value was 0 when we tested the standard hypothesis. We got this confidence interval for the slope, saying something about the marginal kilometer effect. Could be as low as 2.12 or as high as 2.33, but most likely somewhere in between. And this SE estimate was 2.22. So my more theoretically founded margin of error would be two times that, which is 4.44. Um, and then you remember maybe in the beginning when we looked at the picture, I just guessed at 5, plus minus 5 as the margin of error. So my visual idea wasn't that bad off, but more correctly, it's 4.44 if you want to go 95%. And to make one forecast for a 10 kilometer trip, we found this estimate. But if we want to say how high or low can it be with 95% probability, you take this and plus minus this margin of error. So it could be down to 19 minutes or it could be up to uh, uh, 27.90, right? But most likely somewhere in between. Yeah, so that's a fairly quick uh, intro to the single variable regression model. Try to do some exercises and then we'll keep on uh, next week. Nej, då måste du bli med mig. Jag har dem på kontoret. Ja, okej. Om du vill ha dem så Ja, det är väl du sikt, syns du.